Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's Critical Issues Confronting China seminar. We're going to wait about a minute. We'll give people who are logging on at the last minute a chance to get settled, and then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. I will. I welcome everyone to the forum. And today we welcome an old friend and colleague who appeared on the forum just about two years ago. Ezra Vogel invited Dave Dollar to educate and present about Chinese economic development and his challenges. And now he's going to give us the latest analysis he has done. David is a leading expert on Chinese economy, but also on US and the China economic relations. He's a senior fellow at Brookings Institution, leading some of their studies on Chinese economy. Before he went to Brookings, they spent 20 years at the World Bank, specialized in Chinese and Asia economy. And he was a director of research and published numerous papers in his career. Now, of course, the US Treasury Department saw such a talented person is there, they poached him and recruited him to be the US Treasury Department representative in China on economic and financial affairs. So we have a really a person who has not only the intellectual and academic expertise, but really frontline experience in China. I first met Dave 15 years ago in China when he was the director of the World Bank's China office. And I was so impressed by his, the depth and breadth of his knowledge of Chinese economy. I asked myself, how could anybody retain and know so much? So we are here today and the privilege to have him, but particularly Dave just co so many top Chinese economic experts trying to take a look at the long run economic development for China and the challenges China faces. Without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Nick first. We're going to give you some instructions. Then Dave is going to automatically follow Nick. Nick. Thank you. Um, so I'll be quick. Uh, those of you who have been here before know the drill. If you're new, welcome. Um, if you want to ask questions at any point during the talk, uh, we will have a Q&A section at the end, but you can always enter in your questions at the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, there, This is being recorded and will be put up on YouTube afterwards. Um, so if you want to ask your question anonymously, there is an option to do so. But if not, please identify yourself and your institution so we know who's asking the question. Um, 
Well, thank you very much. I'm David Dollar, and it's really a great pleasure to join this seminar. Uh, Bill, thank you for the very kind introduction and also for putting in a plug for the book that I did recently with economists from Peking University called China 2049. And 2049, of course, is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. And Chinese people, Chinese government, they aspire to reaching high income by 2049, not necessarily catching up with the living standards of the West, but moving into the high income category. And of course, development is about more than just GDP growth. People have a broad set of desires for clean environment, for good health care, for controlling something like this COVID-19 pandemic that we've had. So I think in many ways, development gets more complicated once you get to middle income which is China's squarely situated in middle income with per capita GDP of about $10,000. And growing growth naturally slows down as you develop. So maintaining a healthy growth rate is a challenge. And then, as I said, there's a broad range of desires that people have that go beyond the narrow economics. So there's so many things we could talk about. Uh, but in the interest of discipline, I'm just going to focus on three. And in the question and answer, we can get into any topics that people are interested in. The three things I want to emphasize is essentially three transitions that China is going through. Uh, the first is demographic. China used to be an economy with a rapidly growing labor force. Now it's going to become an economy with a declining labor force. Second transition, China used to be very investment dependent and still is to a large extent. It needs to become a more innovative economy if it's going to sustain growth and address issues like climate change and environmental sustainability. So investment to innovation is a transition. And then third, on the external front, I'm going to argue that the world was very welcoming to China in the early phases of its reform, welcoming China into the world economy, but the attitude around the world toward China has become more hostile in the last few years. So China's facing a somewhat difficult external environment. So I'll talk about the implications of each and identify some policies that China can use to mitigate the problems, uh, turn these disadvantages or or turn these transitions, as I call them, into positives. So first on the demographics, you know, Chairman Mao thought that having a lot of people was a strength and under his reign, China encouraged births, population expanded very rapidly. Uh, unfortunately, it was a mostly poor population that expanded and around the beginning of economic reform, the, new Communist Party leadership under Deng Xiaoping definitely wanted to bring the population growth under control. And they introduced the one-child policy. Beyond the one-child policy, there are also a lot of reasons why, as countries develop, fertility tends to go down. Women are educated. There are more health care opportunities. There are more work opportunities, so the opportunity cost of raising children goes up. So I don't think we should put everything on the one child policy, uh, but the bottom line is that fertility dropped quite substantially. You know, and this essentially gives you two phases of demographic transition. The first is very pro-growth. So you had that big population born during the 1950s and 1960s entering the labor force in the 1970s and 1980s. So as China was pursuing economic reform, it had a rapidly growing labor force. Uh, and that's a challenge for the government, but it's also an opportunity. You know, if you can create jobs for that group, then your economy is going to grow very rapidly and living standards are going to go up. I remember when I you know, first 
started teaching and working in China in 1986 and continuing on at different periods, a general rule was that China needed to create 20 million jobs per year for this expanding population. Uh, and so that, as I said, is both a challenge and an opportunity. Now, one aspect of dealing with that opportunity is that 80% of the population was rural at the beginning of economic reform. And most of the job creation was in cities around export development, around various service sectors expanding, constructing infrastructure. Uh, so there was a mismatch in a sense between where people were and where they were needed economically. Every country that's developed has gone through this kind of rural urban migration. In China, it was somewhat unique because most of it took place under the migrant worker system where able-bodied people from the countryside were able to move to cities if they had jobs, but in general, they left their children and often their parents behind. Uh, they you know, maintained some connection to the land uh, as they moved to the cities. So that migrant worker system was very efficient from an economic point of view, because uh, it enabled a lot of workers to move quickly and you know, by not bringing their families, they did not impose a big social burden on cities. You know, on the other hand, it's obviously a, an unfair system. Having a rural registration in China, uh, up, certainly up until recently, has consigned you to having a substandard set of of uh, social services and social benefits. Now, fertility went down you know, pretty dramatically with the one child policy and with economic development. And that's continued on. <clears throat> We've reached a point where the fertility rate, total fertility rate in China is well below replacement. It's at about 1.7, replacement's 2.1. Uh, and in this situation, you're starting to get very dramatic aging of the population. So you can think of this mix of policies creating this big bulge in the labor force in the 1980s, 1990s, into the 2000s. And now the process is going to go in reverse. The working age population has basically peaked in China and is going to start to decline now. And what's really striking about the demographics is that the share of elderly in the population is gonna go up very dramatically. So we have some projections in our book and of course there's uncertainty, but demographics is something you can project ahead pretty well uh, because a lot of this is just really you know, baked in now. And what we're gonna find is you know, we estimate that the population over 65 will double between now and 2049. But what's more striking is that the population 85 and older will quadruple. So by 2049, China will have more in this old, old group over 85 than the United States and the European Union combined. The labor force will be declining and the only part of the labor force that will be expanding is the 55 to 64 year olds. Every other group uh, is basically set to decline. Now this creates a lot of challenges and I wanna emphasize, I think it's probably more a social challenge than an economic challenge. A lot of the elderly live in the countryside. So they, if you look at the rural population, the share, these, these numbers are more glaring in the rural areas than in urban areas. So you've got a lot of old people living in the countryside. I'm sure many of them are happy to be living in the countryside and many will be healthy, uh, but they're gonna be a growing number of old people who wanna move to the cities to be close to their grown up children, to have better access to social services. So there's a lot of, call in China now to completely dismantle the hukou system so people can move more easily. Uh, 
uh, one of the provinces, one of the central provinces. I just had a had a senior moment. I forgot which central province, but one of them is completely eliminated. You know the the restrictions on getting an urban hookah so people can move freely. So we're beginning to see examples of this. But on the other hand, the flagship cities, you know, which are the most productive cities along the coast, like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, they tend to still be pretty restrictive uh, in terms of inward migration. And then aside from the elderly population, you also have a disproportionate number of children living in the countryside, the left behind children. Uh, and they are you know, educating them well and bringing them successfully into the urban labor force. You know, that's the kind of policy that'll help China mitigate the effects of these demographic changes. We've seen the labor force participation in China drop quite significantly during the last 20 years of economic development and reform. Uh, a variety of reasons, uh, but often in many situations, commuting to work or finding childcare for the young parents who have children, this is difficult. So there's a set of social policies China could pursue uh, that most importantly would address the social aspects of this transformation, uh, but they would also tend to be good for the economy because you want to maintain labor force participation of people who really would like to be working if the circumstances are right. right. Most of the jobs are going to be in the cities, so you're going to need more rural urban migration, including migrants. The urban population is now about 60% in China. And when South Korea was at this level of development, the urbanization rate was 80% can't make an exact comparison, but we know China has all these restrictions and it apparently is less urbanized than other Asian societies. So there's a set of social policies and actually I didn't even mention one of the most important. In the public sector, you still have men retiring at 60 and women at 55 and given life expectancy in China, which I think is higher than in the United States now, uh, you certainly would want to have uh, different parameters for retirement and for pensions. So overall, you're going to need reform of the pension system, you know, health, education, break down the rural-urban divide. All of these measures would help China deal with this, this very important demographic challenge. Now, the second trans transition I want to emphasize is from investment to innovation. You know, China is a high savings rate country. That's not likely to change quickly. You know, it's been a high investment country. During the boom period, I, I think of the early 2000s as the real golden age of China's growth after it joined WTO up until the global financial crisis. And in that period, you had very high investment. It was financing factories that were exporting housing, there had been a real serious housing shortage, infrastructure, hard to remember now, but infrastructure used to be deficient in China. So there were a lot of needs and for investment and China had a high savings rate and frankly, a relatively simple financial system. You know, state-owned commercial banks would take deposits from households, lend those to the exporting factories, real estate developers, local government for infrastructure construction. Uh, and you know we tend to criticize the state-owned financial system in China. Uh, but I think in that early 2000 period, it did an adequate job of channeling resources to the sectors that I just mentioned. One piece of evidence that this was all working pretty well is that the overall leverage in the Chinese economy was quite stable. So there was a lot of credit from the banking system financing investment, but that generated rapid growth. So when you looked at the total debt stock relative to GDP, it was amazingly stable in China throughout that period of rapid export growth. 
But then that completely changed with the global financial crisis. <clears throat> China's exports uh, dropped during the crisis to meet the demand shortfall. The government stepped in with massive further infrastructure spending. Infrastructure spending was already pretty large, but it was ramped up and lots of high-speed rails and metros and other things were built. Some of that I'm sure is very good, uh, but there's evidence that overall China overbuilt the capital stock in this period. Also housing, you, know, you have the famous stories about empty apartment buildings, empty cities. China went from being a somewhat housing shortage economy uh, to having uh, excess building in certain parts of the country. And again, you can see this transition in the leverage ratio. So what happened <clears throat> after the global financial crisis is overall debt to GDP in China started rising and continued to rise uh, with some fits and starts, uh, but it's gone up by more than 100 percentage points of GDP in a relatively short time, you know, economically speaking, in, in a little bit more than 10 years. And this is a sign that, you know, again, credit is financing investment, but if the investment is not generating a lot of benefit, a lot of economic growth, then you end up with the debt, but you don't have as much increase in the GDP. And so the debt to GDP ratio goes up. That's what we've been seeing in China over the last 15 years. And it's a very powerful indicator of what we call diminishing marginal returns to investment. China's built a lot of capital stock. If you just keep building the same kind of stuff, the return to further investment goes down. And that, you know, that your growth rate goes down and financial risks build up in the financial system. Some of this is inevitable, but the extent of this shift uh, is quite dramatic in China. And the only real way to counteract it is to build up innovation. Because if your central bank is aware of all these issues and they're trying to rein in the growth of credit now, and in some periods in the last few years, they've succeeded. The last year, 2020, there was a, a huge increase uh, in debt to GDP in China as part of the response to the pandemic. But as the central bank tries to rein in the growth of credit and investment, you know, as I said, the growth rate naturally slows down. More innovation can counteract that. You know, first, directly, innovation contributes to GDP growth, uh, but then it does also open up some additional profitable investment opportunities. So you can counteract the diminishing returns to some extent by having a steady or even increasing rate of innovation. In the innovation area, China is a really interesting case because it's got a lot of positive markers, uh, particularly on the input side. So China is spending 2.4% of GDP on R&D, uh, and that, that's the second greatest amount after the United States. China is literally turning out millions of STEM graduates. That's science, technology, engineering, and math every year. So it's got a big pool of talent. Uh, clearly, I mean, there's lots of patenting activity, most of which comes from the private sector in China. And there've been some very clear successes like the FinTech advance, uh, you know, the use of mobile payments on people's cell phones, uh, some technologies, China is clearly making impressive progress. And there's actually a certain amount of panic in the West, this worry that China is going to dominate everything. Well, in terms of the evidence at the moment, the evidence goes exactly the other direction. Despite those successes that I mentioned, we don't see much productivity growth in China. You know, this is the economist's bottom line is what are we getting out of innovation? Are we getting a lot of increase in labor productivity across the board in many different sectors. And actually we're not seeing that. Productivity growth has slowed down very dramatically in China. Uh, and now it's always possible there are a bunch of pent up innovations that are about to uh, 
have an explosive effect on the economy. Uh, but so far, we don't really see uh, a very impressive economy-wide output from China's big innovation effort. And I think part of the problem here is, while China has some good fundamentals that I mentioned, uh, it also uh, has a fairly intrusive industrial policy. Uh, President Xi Jinping likes the idea of building up powerful state enterprises that would be champions in their sector, but state enterprises have no track record of innovation. Uh, so they seem to be getting a lot of the resources for innovation, uh, but they don't generate much output. Most of the patents and the impressive innovations are coming from the Chinese private sector. So the recommendation we make in our book, and you know, most of the authors are Chinese economists, the recommendation we make is that China strengthen those fundamentals like improving intellectual property rights protection, improving the universities. It needs a more diverse financial system with venture capital and different types of financing sources, you know, less state control over the financial system. Um, and they need to continue to open up the economy because international competition is definitely one of the important recipes behind innovation. Uh, you've probably heard of this phrase, dual circulation. For an economist, it's a somewhat you know, confusing phrase. It's not clear what it means. It could mostly signify the idea that China has to rely primarily on domestic demand. Uh, and with the right foundation, it could also be uh, a source of innovation and progress on the supply side. But there's a little bit of a worry that it carries a protectionist connotation of China, you know, closing off certain markets, uh, trying to develop technologies through subsidies and state enterprises. Uh, and you know, history suggests this is not likely to be a successful approach. Uh, and it's certainly, it's gonna link to the last topic I'm gonna take up. Uh, it certainly makes China's external relations more complicated uh, if it's pursuing that kind of policy. Now, the third transition I want to talk about is the external environment. Looking back, I think we can say that the world was very welcoming of China uh, economically as its economic reform began and progressed. Uh, China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. It had an extraordinary explosion of exports. It was basically completely irrelevant in global trade before 1979, 1980. Uh, and it's risen up to become the largest trading nation. I think it has about 14% of global exports. Uh, there's been a lot of Western foreign direct investment into China. Lots of evidence that you know, that has helped uh, raise China's growth rate, a lot of technology transfer. Countries like the United States have accepted a large amount of imports from China, which has helped China develop. But what's happened roughly in the last 10 years is that the attitude of the West toward China has definitely soured. And I think there's both economic and non-economic factors at work. On the economic side, China made a lot of reforms in order to join the WTO and in the first few years after WTO membership. Many of us thought this was the beginning of a continuous process of China opening up and reforming. But frankly, reforms stalled between about 2005 and 2015. There wasn't much further opening. And there were a lot of distortions that have been accepted as part of the WTO agreement. And I would say on the Western side, there was the assumption that these would be phased out over time, uh, but China stuck with a lot of these distortions for quite a while. Let me be more concrete. You know, one of the sensitive areas was the automobile sector. China's WTO agreement allowed China to have a 25% tariff on automobiles and to require foreign investors like the big international auto companies to operate through joint ventures. 
usually joint ventures where the foreign partner did not have majority control. And, and there are other important sectors where we had similar restrictions on investment. Uh, and the Western firms came to feel that this was a, a way of forcing them to transfer their technology to Chinese partners you know, who had other lines of business and would start competing you know, with the joint venture and potentially with the international firms in third markets. So I think that's one of the striking things watching the US-China relationship is the business community used to be a voice for further integration between China and the US, mutual opening up. Uh, but the business community has become a lot more negative about China uh, over the last 10 years or so. This also relates to the last thing I mentioned when I talked about innovation. You know, China announced this made in China 2025 policy, had a very bold statement that it was going to dominate, you know, 10 major technologies of the future. You know, hard to then kind of negotiate trade and investment agreements with other countries uh, when you've made that kind of intention clear. And then we also have the non-economic issues. This is not my area of specialty, but I'm certainly happy to discuss this in the Q&A. You've got South China Sea conflict, Hong Kong, Xinjiang. So I think all of these uh, disputes between China and various external partners, that's also influenced the environment uh, and spilled over into the economic realm. So the end result is compared to 20 years ago, there are a lot of investment and trade restrictions concerning China. You know, President Trump imposed a 25% tariff on imports, of about half of what we import from China. And the Biden administration is certainly not moving to undo that. And then you have different types of investment restrictions uh, you have security reviews preventing Chinese companies from investing in the United States. You have export controls on sensitive items. Now, when we actually look at outcomes, I think it's interesting that I, some of these measures really do not seem to have much effect. So I don't want to exaggerate the importance of some of these specific measures. You know, I mentioned the tariffs that the US has imposed but actually, if you look at 2020, we imported almost the same amount from China as the year before. You know, despite the pandemic, despite severe recession in the US, our imports from China were only down 3%. Uh, and meanwhile, our imports from some nearby countries, countries nearby China, you know, like Vietnam, Taiwan economy, the US imported significantly more so when you look at greater, what you might call developing Asia, and, you know, I'm not just talking about greater China, I'm adding in you know, South Korea, Vietnam. You look at developing Asia and US imports actually went up during 2020, a recession year, uh, despite these restrictions. And we know in some cases, we know what's happening. The US it used to import all its Christmas lights from China. That's one of the items that got hit with the 25% tariff. Uh, so I read that a lot of the industry shifted to Cambodia and that includes Chinese manufacturers who moved production to Cambodia. And so the United States imported all its Christmas lights from Cambodia uh, and China ended up exporting a lot of machinery and components. Uh, so the point I'm making there is so, some of these measures really uh, do not seem to have been terribly effective. Uh, so, so don't believe this language about decoupling between the US and Chinese economies. You know, that does not seem to be happening. Uh, China received a uh, historic amount of direct foreign investment last year, including from American companies. Despite the recession and the pandemic, China was number one in terms of receiving direct foreign investment last year. Uh, AmCham survey of American companies in China uh, found that only 
are thinking about reshoring production from China back to the US. You know, so some of these ex more extreme ideas about decoupling uh, are unrealistic and are certainly not occurring in reality. But having said that, I still think this change in external environment is disadvantageous for China, particularly the combination of restrictions on Chinese companies investing in the US, export controls on uh, semiconductor machinery and various high tech products. And it's not clear where our policy towards students is gonna settle, but it seems that there's a less friendly environment for welcoming Chinese STEM students to graduate programs in the United States. So I think in terms of China's innovation and technology development, those last set of measures that I was just emphasizing, I think those are, those are gonna set China back uh, in terms of its economic aspirations, in terms of its innovation. So what can China do? I think it's gonna be hard to turn this around, but the, the, the risk it seems to me is that faced with a more hostile external environment, it's tempting for China to turn more inward. And you see elements of that in the dual circulation idea and in China's industrial policy, China 2025. But the good news is we also see some tendencies that go the other way. And I think that is the smart policy for China. So for example, China is part of this RCEP agreement, big trade agreement among 10 ASEAN countries, plus Japan, South Korea, China, Australia, New Zealand. I think that's quite significant in terms of preserving open trade in the Pacific and solidifying Asia's role in global value chains. And I mentioned China had a record amount of direct foreign investment, uh, both for China and it was number one in the world last year, replacing the United States. Part of that is that China has opened up more sectors. It's undone those restrictions on autos that I mentioned. It's opened up financial services. It's opening up aspects of healthcare. So I think that's a very positive uh, inclination. You clearly have some Chinese leaders who understand that continuing to open up to the global economy, trade and investment, that's really the whole underpinning of this convergence process. China also negotiated an investment treaty with Europe, and that seemed to be potentially very significant, agreed right at the end of 2020. So after President Biden was elected, China inked two big deals the RCEP agreement that I mentioned and this European treaty called the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, CAI. But then more recently, China has sanctioned members of the European Parliament who have to vote on this. Uh, so at the moment, the prospects for the European treaty are completely unclear. There's certainly many commentators who think that it's dead. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that is a, fair conclusion at the moment because there's, it was never gonna be ratified immediately. Uh, so there's still time, uh, but it, it's a good illustration of the kind of tension that China faces, you know, where it's brought a non-economic issue essentially into the potential to settle this economic treaty. So the bottom line here is there are a lot of positive still in place for China. I've mentioned these transitions, each of which is a sort of challenge, but of course China has lots of positives. Uh, it's got a high savings rate that I mentioned. It is pretty well integrated into the global economy. It's got a lot of things going for it. It will probably surpass the United States as the biggest economy in the world measured at market exchange rates within this decade. But then the more important question I think is what's happening as you go out further 20 years, 30 years toward that 2049 centenary. centenary. Uh, and there, 
I've tried to identify three key issues where if China deals poorly with these issues, it's likely to stagnate, you know, stagnated around 25% of US per capita income. It's kind of upper middle income, not really meet its aspirations. Uh, on the other hand, it's got domestic policies it could implement in terms of hukou reform, restructuring social services and pensions, uh, family friendly measures to get more people into the labor force. It's got things it can do in terms of financial reform, encouraging innovation, strengthening intellectual property rights, new economic agreements. So even if relations with the US are difficult, uh, there are other potential partners around the world. So a lot will depend on whether or not China can address these challenges. And we will inevitably see slower growth compared to that spectacular past. But it's going to make a big difference over a long period of time, whether China is growing at 2 or 3%, which is you know, similar to the advanced economies, slightly better, uh, or can it sustain something closer to five uh, for a significant period of time, in which case it will you know, start getting up pretty, not close to the level of US per capita income, but certainly uh, a lot higher than 25%, which is all it really has to hit in order to be the biggest economy in the world. So Bill, I'm gonna stop there and happy to take questions on these or any related topics. Thank you, David. That's an excellent broad view of the uh, challenges confronting China for, uh, for the <clears throat> 2049 or even in the intermediate range. Uh, I'd like to ask you, a related question, but not directly what you presented. In your book, you point out a very important aspect of Chinese economic policy. That is, you call it a, symmetry, a symmetrical liberalization. China really, in its product market, liberalized let the market determine its prices. But on the input side, like land, capital, and, uh, uh, the, and energy, China actually maintained the central planning type of control. For China to move forward, what do you think China has to do to make the, you call the product and the factor markets to equilibrate? Okay, thank you, Bill. That's a great question. Uh, you know, I think one thing we've learned from these various histories of transition economies that start out with fully planned socialist economy try to make a transition to a market economy. It's very difficult. And a well-functioning market economy has all kinds of institutions and norms. And a country that's been following socialism, in my view, cannot instantaneously create all those institutions. So I think we should have an open mind about the different paths countries take. Uh, I. I respect China for moving quickly to open up most of the product markets. And you know, even that's a challenge, but that's where international trade is so important. You know, especially at low income, you know, a lot of what's produced in the economy is traded internationally. If you become part of an international economy, in some ways that sets the prices for various food items and clothing and things. And, yeah, that's an institution that you can join very quickly, the global trade regime. But we know that on the factor market side, I would, and I would say this is most important for capital, for the allocation of finance. So many countries have tried to liberalize their financial systems, 
and have had big costly financial crises. So it's easy to criticize China's financial system. And we're very frank, we have an index of repression. You know, China still has a relatively repressed financial system. But I understand that moving quickly to liberalize finance has more often than not led to financial crisis. So, so China's been very cautious. My co-authors and I think we've been, they've been a little too cautious. I, I do think one of the lessons from China is some of the policies that work at one stage of development can then become a problem at a higher stage. So China's fin repressed financial system, you can argue it was an advantage when China was just allocating capital, you know, household savings going into the export sector. But now, you know, given the changing nature of the economy and the importance of innovation, uh, I think the Chinese financial sector is, is uh, you know, definitely a drag on the economy. So, you know, liberalizing that, but very carefully, and I think that was applied to some of my comments about the labor market too. The, you know, the hukou system is a set of restrictions on the labor market Again, eh, you know, it, everything's trade-offs. Arguably, it worked pretty well for China for a while. Now, I think it's it's yeah. It, I mean, one one way to think about their demographics is workers are going to be really scarce. So you want workers to go to where they're most productive, and any distortion is going to be high cost. Uh, and so they definitely need to reform some of their policies in order to get people moving around, hey, look at you and me, Bill, there are plenty of people over 65 who wanna keep working. You know, so you wanna keep us healthy and you wanna have a, a, an incentive system where we can continue to work. Yes. So, so you're going even beyond uh, just the, <coughs> uh, the product market, I'm sorry, input market, you went into a labor as the input too that needs to open up. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, next question is uh, posed by Flevin um, Be Benigers. I'm not sure I pronounced his name correctly. Uh, he's, he or she asked, China needs more investment or spending for social programs, as you mentioned. And uh, what are the political costs? And I, along with that question, I would add, China has to invest in the social programs as education, health, social protection, pension. What does China have to do to change its physical policy? that is taxation system to be able to raise the revenue to pay for it. Okay. Um, sorry, what was the first question, Bill? The, the, the first question is what would be the political cost? Oh, right, right. I should learn to take notes while the questions are being uh, asked. Okay. I think on the political side, the main divide here is that this, you know, traditional hukou system and the division of the rural and urban social services works very well for the urban registered population. That's now about 40% of China is urban registered. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that migrant worker system, you know, it means that workers come in to Guangzhou and they work and they contribute to GDP and they contribute to taxes, but they don't put a lot of burden on the social services because they've left their children and their parents in the countryside. And so the registered urban population, I think, you know, they, they like this system uh, where the migrants contribute to their GDP and taxes, but are not a burden. Uh, so you, you really need strong leadership to just essentially you know, break that and say that you know, China now can afford 
to provide the rural population with better services through a combination of spending more in the countryside and allowing more people to move to cities. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I would also say another interest group, um, I mean, it kind of links to the second question uh, about fiscal. So, you know, how do you pay for this? If you think of it as a national issue, you know, I think China can easily afford to spend quite a bit more on health and education. I can see how an individual local government, if they think they're on their own, this is kind of scary because you might suddenly have a big influx of migrants. But if you think of the country as a whole, uh, they can afford this. And I would say it relates to that the issue I mentioned that they at this point tend to be over investing in infrastructure. Uh, so they need to redirect some of those resources away from physical infrastructure. You, you might not need another stretch of high speed passenger rail, right? Might be better to invest in rural education, for example, in terms of meeting people's needs and preparing for the economy of the future. But then it relates to the political question because that's one more group that's gonna be opposed. You've got a lot of big construction companies in China you know, who make high-speed passenger rail and build different types of infrastructure. They're happy with the system. Uh, and you know, they're not gonna be happy if you shift the fiscal resources uh, from infrastructure to social services. So I, I, th I think financially, it's not a problem. I think it is more of a political problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question is from Barbara Rosenberg. Uh, he asked, in the auto, auto industry or the, in the financial industry, China has really opened uh, encourage large companies. And uh, should China really open up for small companies or encourage small companies? What's the role of the small companies? No, I think, thanks. These are all really good questions. Um, the, I think on paper, you know, China is pretty open to both small and big companies. But in practice, there's still a lot of discretion by local authorities and even certain central authorities. And so I think objectively, China is an expensive place for small companies to do business. Uh, and so China's losing out because you, you, know, you can get a lot, of course, from the big international firms, the names that we all know, uh, but there are a lot of very innovative, you know, small and medium firms and, and I definitely hear from the Europeans, you know, that their firms feel like it, it's just too hard to operate in China. And so China's missing out on that. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Lian. Uh, he said, uh, how should China look upon the decoupling in currency. I think he or she is specifically uh, talking about using renminbi as a, a currency for trade and for reserves. Can you come on that? Yes, so I think, you know, the, the, the Chinese <clears throat> government, they're unhappy with the way the US uses the primary role of the dollar in the global system to impose various sanctions and to you know, try to get various extraterritorial behavior. But I think it's gonna be hard for China to get around this. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of incumbency advantage uh, to be, you know, for the dollar being the current primary reserve currency. I don't see that changing quickly. I don't know any serious, you know, international economists who think that'll change quickly. Even in China's Belt and Road program, for example, most of the Chinese lending is in dollars. You know, and that's because that's 
you know, if you're a developing country and you're borrowing a lot of money from China, you want to owe dollars. Because, you know, what does it mean to owe Chinese yuan? You don't know, you can't freely get those in the international market. So if China is serious about addressing this, you know, they have to move on the whole agenda of you know, reforming their financial system, opening up the capital account, developing deeper stock and bond markets so it's attractive for international you know, players to hold renminbi. And they're doing all those things, but they're doing them slowly and cautiously. And, you know, it would be, I'd be happy if they would speed up a little bit. Uh, but I think, as I said, at, at some point, if you, you know, if you very quickly open up the whole financial system, you could easily have a financial crisis. Then the whole thing just, you know, what you're trying to achieve, it just backfires on you. Very, very good advice. Go slow, careful, but do move though. But do it, but do it. <laughs> yes. um, here's a bigger question um, from Fan Xiaotong, who is a visiting scholar at Fairbank Center. He or she asked you a uh, comment that she liked uh, he or she liked your recommendation to the Biden administration, and she read it. What's the chances your recommendations will be taken? So do you mind cover some of your major recommendations and also your prediction about President Biden would accept it, them? Right. So, you know, I think the basic framework that Secretary of State Blinken is talking about I have no problem with. In the basic framework is there are areas where the US disagrees with China and is gonna oppose Chinese action in the South China Sea, for example. There are areas where our interests clearly overlap like climate change. And then there are areas where we're gonna compete. And I guess the problem I have is that third one, I find a little bit vague and you know, I would prefer that they put the economic relationship clearly in the basket of areas where we could cooperate. So there is this narrative that's developed in the United States, you know, that China's cheating us and we don't get any benefit from this. And I, as an economist, I just think that's wrong. You know, the economic exchange, it's all, you know, mutual. You know, we, we choose to buy a lot of electronic products from China. We also bought a lot of medical equipment, uh, pharmaceuticals during the pandemic. Uh, you know, so we choose to buy a lot of things from China uh, and their companies are happy to produce and sell. Uh, and then there's a lot of exchange in the other direction. The only bright spot in our exports in 2020 was that our exports to China went up by about 17%. You know, whereas for the rest of the world, pretty much everywhere, our exports went down. You know, it was a, it was a recession year. Uh, but I think we, you know, we, we are missing the opportunity, you know, to recognize that there's advantages, mutual advantages in the economic relationship. Now, having said that, it is very hard. You know, I think it's hard to have this framework where you clearly say where there's certain things we're going to oppose, but there are other areas where we can work together. But I don't see any way around that in the case of the US-China relations. But then there is an issue of how you actually carry out that diplomacy. Personally, I thought kind of publicly uh, criticizing the Chinese diplomats in Alaska with the TV cameras rolling that did not seem like effective diplomacy to me. So I think there's substance and then there's also tone, which is important. Now, as far as the Biden administration policy, you know, I would say it's starting out pretty hawkish toward China and it may just stay there, but I think there's a reasonable chance that by 2022, the U.S. attitude may soften a bit because I think Biden is serious about working internationally 
on a range of issues, especially climate change, Iran, also rebuilding our alliance system. And when he talks to the Europeans or the South Koreans, they have a much more balanced view of China uh, than we find in the United States. So it's possible that the Biden administration policy will evolve towards something more balanced, uh, but I wouldn't expect it during 2021. Okay, you have a quite a clear crystal ball. Well, I thought I was pretty cautious. <laughs> Uh, a question from Guo Zhongjun. Uh, he, he or she really asking, uh, there are different uh, trade agreements, let's say, between European Union or CAI and or TTP. What's the pro what do you think is the chance that Biden or China would be able to join TTP? So I think in the case of the Biden administration, they've been pretty clear they're not going to move in the first year. But it's a little bit similar to my last answer. I think by the time we get to 2022, they may well be feeling quite a bit of pressure from different international partners you know, to get back into the Asia Pacific economy. And TPP would, would be one way to do it. It's also possible they could just take an important piece of that. So there's some talk about a data agreement, you know, among the US plus the existing TPP countries. So, so some kind of movement uh, back into Asia Pacific agreement seems likely to me, but again, not the priority in 2021. I'm encouraged that China's talked about joining TPP. It's a pretty big lift. Uh, you know, China, it has protocols on data. Uh, actually, intellectual property rights, I think China's made a lot of progress. I don't think that's such a problem. Uh, but state enterprises, subsidies, it would be a pretty heavy lift for China. It would be smart because it's exactly the kind of reforms China needs. Uh, but I wouldn't put the probability too high. And also, we have to be honest, the next two years are going to be very political. You know, you've got the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party founding. You've got the Party Congress next year. Probably Xi Jinping will continue for a third term. So I think this is an environment where the Chinese top leadership will want stability. And it will definitely be something of an economic fight in China. There would be winners and losers. And Xi Jinping probably doesn't want to take that fight on in the next two years. Hey, thank you. Um, you you use the word uh, China has to move toward uh, innovative innovation economy, and of course you touch upon uh, the STEM, you know the human resources. But to innovate, you also have to really, to be a top leader, you really have to do basic science, advanced basic science and technology. Can you comment on what do you think is the Chinese ability and capacity to really advance basic science? or really very major innovation technology. Okay, so now we're definitely getting out a little bit outside of my, kind of my expertise. But my sense is that, you know, when we look at Chinese universities, uh, in the humanities and social sciences, you know, we can criticize them that, you know, lack of freedom of speech and, access to the global internet, the, all of these things, you know, probably hamper intellectual, uh, in the intellectual environment. But I was under the impression that in the sciences, Chinese-based researchers are just very active publishing papers and being part of the international community. So uh, 
I would have thought China was in a good position to do basic research. And if I were going to criticize their policy, it's, you know, I mentioned they spend 2.4% of GDP on R&D, which is pretty good, but I think they don't spend enough on basic research in the universities that gets into the global public domain. And then they spend too much, you know, subsidizing state enterprises in particular technologies, which is not really a winning strategy. So I think China has the human resources and the universities uh, that could be at the heart of major basic research. But, um, yeah, I mean, but I repeat, I'm, I, this is definitely getting beyond my area of expertise. So that's my impression. Thanks. Uh, Chris Nielsen from Harvard asked, a question related to climate change. I will read his question. Do you think a climate crisis may upend some conventional projection over the long run? Strengthen China's international engagement in developing countries, especially in Asia and Africa. For instance, China. Chinese capacity in cleaning energy deployment uh, may strengthen the BRI style of investment and the economic integration into countries with limited capacity to transform their own energy systems. Right, so this is another great question. I think China is going to be a big loser from climate change. You know, the latest projection is cities like Shanghai are going to be largely underwater. Parts of it will be underwater by the middle of this century. And developing countries in general are going to be big losers. So I think uh, there's the potential for China to have a very smart, uh, self-serving diplomatic push to transform BRI in a more green direction. One of the problems with BRI is we don't have very good information or statistics, but I saw one elaboration of all the power plants that China is financing in the developing world. And a lot of that is coal fired and a similar amount is hydro and almost none of it is solar or wind. Now, the countries that are borrowing from China, they're key to making these decisions. You know, I think, you know, I think in the West, we don't always recognize the agency of these countries, but the potential should be there for China to, you know, work with many of these countries on their plans for renewable energy, and then to finance and build, you know, hydro is renewable, but there's huge potential for wind and solar and coal, we all have to get out of coal, frankly. Uh, so, so I think the potential is there. And I reiterate the data are not very good, but my impression uh, is that you, you don't really have a coordinated green strategy toward BRI. You have, as I say, you have a lot of coal fired plants being financed. They're gonna last for 50 years. Uh, if we get too much of that, then it's just really hard to see how we meet these global targets. All right. Uh, another qu question is, how should the companies balance the need to capture the market opportunities in China and also maintain their values? Uh, th yeah, this is like the million dollar question for global corporations now. Um, I, I guess that what my, you know, what I would uh, lead with as an answer uh, is we have to remember there, there's so many different types of products of goods and services. And I think probably a lot of companies are going to be able to duck this issue. You know, there's a lot of trade between China and the US, for example, in parts and components. You know, so some firm uh, that's buying a certain amount of parts and components from China, uh, 
you know, unless their supplier happens to be based in Xinjiang, you know, which is frankly unlikely, you know, they can probably just keep their head down. Uh, but when you get more on the consumer side, which we see now with Nike and with the Swedish firm H&M, and we saw this with the NBA not too long ago, the companies are going to have to navigate this minefield. You know, if they want to do business in both the U.S. and China and the rest of the world, they have to be sensitive to public opinion all over the world, and the public opinion is going to differ. You know, so they may they may make a statement they think is placating their American audience, but then it leads to a boycott in China. Uh, I I don't think there's any easy answer uh, for companies except to to be aware, at least you know don't. Don't, don't start a controversy or crisis unnecessarily, basically. Be, be aware that Chinese public opinion matters uh, and obviously public opinion in Europe and the United States matter. And, and some companies may have to choose in the end to favor one market over the other and, and lose out. Uh, but there'll be lots of companies that manage to operate in all different major markets. Here's a different question from uh, Bernard Kirk Kirkhall. Thank you very much for this impressive talk. So in order, I'm paraphrasing, in order to move China to a high income level from middle income trap, China has to move to a high tech product. So not all the neighboring countries or even some local citizens would really benefit from this new innovation techno uh, economy. What do you think is the impact of the artificial intelligence on high tech innovation on China's job market for Chinese people then? Thank you. I really welcome this question. I was hoping someone would ask this question. So there are some scholars in China who think that automation in some sense solves the demographic problem. You know, that the labor force is going to be declining, but automation is going to be wiping out jobs. And in theory, the two could progress at the same pace. Uh, and in that case, the demographics are not a problem. In some sense, they're almost an advantage. And I think the problem with that thinking is that automation does not wipe out jobs across all sectors and occupations. Some occupations are very vulnerable. So suppose, for example, there's a big breakthrough in driverless vehicles. There may be huge numbers of drivers thrown out of work because of automation. And there's certainly going to be some sectors where something like this happens. Meanwhile, China is going to need more healthcare workers. You know, there's no question, you know, China is going to need more workers to take care of the elderly population in, in different situations. Uh, and so the, if, if uh, most of the drivers lose their jobs, you know, but you need more healthcare workers, that's not an easy problem to solve. You know, you're not going to quickly transition uh, the drivers over to being the healthcare workers. So, uh, so I don't think it really, uh, I don't think it really solves the demographic problem. Uh, it, if anything, it's one more complication in the labor market. You know, to try to figure out how to get Chinese people. You know, every society faces this. How do you get as many people as possible working productively? Uh, earning a decent income and automation is going to complicate that. Well, uh, I'm going to take the privilege to just take, uh, take advantage of your expertise, give you the last question. Uh, what would be the impact of the national security law and the deeper socioeconomic integration of Hong Kong with the mainland? have on the country's economy vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? Uh, okay, that's tough. Um, certainly up until recently, 
mainland China benefited a lot from having Hong Kong next door, but a separate economy with its own currency, its own legal system. Uh, you would expect that benefit to be diminishing over time as China develops and opens up. Uh, and in some sense, that was you know, part of the, the, the basic law is that it wasn't clear what was gonna happen after 2047, but I think the implication was that in the long run, Hong Kong would be integrated into the mainland economy. And now what's happening is that's being radically accelerated. Hong Kong is being quickly integrated into the mainland economy. That strikes me as a somewhat risky move from a, from a purely economic point of view, that seems risky uh, because Hong Kong's provided various benefits. But it's a case where the, you know, the politics, I think, are, are trumping the economics. You know, so, so far, Hong Kong economy seems to be holding up pretty well. Uh, but you know, it's more like five years, 10 years. You know, what do things look like 10 years from now? I think that's completely unclear at this point. Well, thank you, David. You faced many tough questions. And uh, you show the depth and the breadth of your knowledge. You help us really to understand much better the challenges confronting China and how China actually decides to do may impact the world and particularly the US-China relations. We are really deeply grateful for your presentation and answering the, a set of very very broad and tough questions. Thank you. Well, Bill, it's really a great pleasure. And I'm always happy to come to Harvard or connect with you virtually. What a great opportunity. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.